So again, good evening everyone. Thank you so much for being here. So uh, heartening to see such a wonderful crowd on, on even such a, a crummy, rainy day. So I really appreciate it and I want to applaud you for making it out here. Uh, as many of you know, I see, see many wonderful, familiar faces. My name is Vineet Chandar, and I have the honor and pleasure of directing Princeton University's Hindu Life Program in our Office of Religious Life. Uh, and working closely with the Princeton Hindu Satsangam, our student organization on campus dedicated to Hindu teachings and tradition. This evening, we're so honored to have with us a very special guest speaker from Mumbai, India. Chaitanya Charan is a monk, a teacher, a blogger, and the author of more than 15 books. After earning his undergraduate degree in electronics and telecommunications, and working as a software engineer in a prominent multinational software corporation. And then exploring the possibility of graduate study. And some of you may remember from the last time he visited, I made it a point to include this bit of trivia in his bio, that he secured a 2350 out of 2400 on his GRE exam, which, is the, which was the top rank in all of Maharashtra. But after all of that, he felt inspired to dedicate his life to the cause of sharing <coughs> spiritual wisdom, particularly from the Bhagavad Gita, with the masses. He has studied under and worked very closely with the renowned Bhakti Yoga teacher, His Holiness Sri Radhanath Swami Maharaj. And Chaitanya Charanji is the author of the world's only Gita Daily feature, GitaDaily.com where he offers a 300-word inspirational reflection on a verse from the Bhagavad Gita every day. His articles have been published in many national newspapers, including Indian Express, The Economic Times, and The Times of India. His latest book, which he will no doubt draw from tonight, is called Demystifying Reincarnation, and we've got copies tonight as well. This evening, Chaitanya Charan will first address us with a short talk on the subject of karma and destiny, and then we will open things up for some Q&A and for some open discussion. Let us share our appreciation for and give a very warm Princeton University welcome to Chaitanya Charan. Grateful to be here amongst all of you today evening. And thank you for coming, as Anita mentioned, on a rainy day. So that is also a part of the karma conundrum. So the weather which we encounter on different days. So I'll speak this in three parts. We'll have a PowerPoint accompanying it. I'll start off from some contemporary situation, then I'll give a contemporary illustration to illustrate a spiritual principle and then I'll conclude with an analysis of the spiritual principle and or the philosophical principle and how it applies for our individual and our spiritual growth. So let's start now on, okay, I think I, do I operate this or somebody else is operating this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Next slide. Please. So we have this is a, especially for Indian, this is a dark day, 26 December, 26 December 2004. So the day when the tsunami devastated Sri Lanka, India, and a significant part of the countries in the Indian Ocean. Now, on that day, there were some scuba divers who had gone into the ocean for diving. And as they were deep in the ocean, they suddenly felt something pushing them up. They were trying to go down, something pushing them up. They kept going down. After some time, that pushing force stopped. They went down, did their expedition, came up, and went back to the coast. And they couldn't find the coast. While they were underwater, the tsunami had swept across the ocean surface and had devastated the coastline. Now, if they had gone for their diving, a little time later, maybe even half an hour later, they would have been on the surface and they would have been smashed by the wave. If they had gone half an hour earlier or later, both ways, <coughs> they would not have been deep with them. They would have been on the surface and they would have been swept away. So the tsunami 
it actually destroyed many people who were off the ocean on the coast and yet people who were in the ocean did not die because they were deep within so in the course of our life we often encounter situations where factors far beyond human control forces far greater than human they step into the course of human affairs and change those human affairs in a dramatic or tragic way and traditions all over the world acknowledge the reality of such forces in english it is called as destiny in the arabic tradition it is called as kismat in the vedic tradition it is called as daiva so there are different words in different traditions but we all in our daily life also notice that there are forces beyond our control so now what are those forces and what determines those forces is going so now before we go deeper into this topic the word destiny has different meanings so when we say uh, can we change destiny so the word destiny is used in two different senses so for example say the people who couldn't or who survived <coughs> or who didn't the scuba divers who survived over there we could say that was their destiny or the people who perished that was their destiny sometimes we use the word destiny to refer to things that happen to us some things which are beyond our control and they happen to us that is one sense in which we use the word destiny another sense in which we use the word destiny is say if there is a child who is a child prodigy maybe in sports sports like cricket or baseball and then that child grows up and becomes a famous sports player they had the talent in childhood and that particular child as a youth became a famous player so then we say they have fulfilled their destiny so here we use the word destiny in terms of what a person achieves so destiny in terms of what happens to us that is something which is not in our control and in that sense destiny in that definition is unchangeable but what we will achieve in our life that is in our hands so in that sense destiny is changeable go ahead please I just yeah, I think you. It's not recording. It's no, it's just the mic maybe a little bit. Okay. So, can you just uh test it for a second? Am I audible now behind? It's better. Can everyone hear okay? Yeah. Okay. Now, so we have when we live in the world, we all have some operating beliefs. We may be he stick when we affiliate with a particular religion we may, we may be non denominationally spiritual we may be atheistic but we all have some beliefs in fact disbelief is also a belief it is a belief in the non existence of any higher order so when we live in the world we basically would be best off if we could choose that understanding of life which hell which is most empowering practically for us so now in the vedic tradition in the yoga tradition there is this understanding that there is karma that the actions that we do they bring reactions now somebody may say who has seen this now, this whole idea of karma i'll relate karma with destiny a little later but the broad understanding of destiny is that okay whatever we get as is the result of our past karma so now somebody may say i don't i don't believe this yes that's possible at the same time we see in our day to day life we function based on an implicit assumption of a cause effect connection so if you go back home and you find your family member has got a burn on their hand we we'll ask them what happened the very question what happened has a presumption in it that whatever has happened it has a cause things don't just happen by chance now if you have a child who normally does very well in studies 
and then you find the child has got an F grade. So what happened? What happened? The question again is, what is the cause of this behavior, or this particular performance? So throughout our life, we so we function based on an assumption of cause-effect connection. So then this same cause-effect connection is the essential principle of karma. So now it is just that in some cases the cause-effect connection is apparent to us. In some cases it may not be apparent. So now consider, let's go, before we talk about specific incidents of destiny, say a particular disaster happening, you know, perhaps the greatest act of destiny that we all encounter in our life is at birth itself. Some of us are born in very wealthy families, some of us born in average middle class families, some of us may be born in poor families, now, some of us are born with uh, very healthy bodies, some of us are born with congenital problems, some of us are born with very good looks, some of us are born with, uh, with poor looks. So now this is, is the starting difference that is there. And this does make a substantial difference in our life. Now why is this difference there? Suppose we went to watch a cricket match. Okay. Or we went to watch a baseball match. <laughs> Which, so in that match, we found that two teams are playing, but one team is starting with a score of zero. And the other team already has a big score to them. In cricket, say they have a 200 run lead. In baseball, we have 10 point or whatever, point lead they have. They're wondering, what is this going on? Why are these two teams having different scores? What possible explanations could be there? One explanation could be that the scoreboard has conked off. <laughs> <laughs> the scoreboard is just uh, functioning randomly. Another explanation could be that <coughs> the scorekeeper is biased. <laughs> and the scorekeeper has given a high score to a team that they favor. Similarly, if you look at life, we all have very diff different people have different starting conditions. One person starts with a score of zero, another person starts with a score of say 200. As I said, some people are born poor, some people are born wealthy. So what could be the explanations for this? Next please. So one could be the chance, the scoreboard has conked off. So it's just chance, you know, some people are born poor, some people are born wealthy, some people are born healthy, some people are born sickly. Now this idea of chance, it actually, it is, it is counterintuitive. Now we all have an intuitive sense of order, cause of a connection, and justice. And this idea that things are happening by chance, it is, it is profoundly counterintuitive. Not only is it counterintuitive, it is extremely disempowering also. Because the whole of existence becomes reduced to a cosmic lottery. And some of us win the lottery, some of us lose it. And if you lose it, bad luck, what to do? There's no further explanation. The other explanation could be that the scorekeeper is biased. So that there is someone in control, that there's some God in control, and that God chooses to make some people healthy, some people sick, some people wealthy, some people poor right from their birth. Now this is actually an even more unsatisfactory explanation. Because we consider God to be good, we consider God to be an object of devotion. How can we worship or devote ourselves to a person who discriminates like this? Now we may say, actually, yeah, but all these differences that are there, they are tests of God. That, you know, the poor people, they are poor because by that they are tested. Their faith and their devotion is tested. The wealthy people are wealthy because their wealth is also a test. Whether they are compassionate, whether they help those who are needy. Yes, that's fine as far as testing is concerned. The principle of testing is fine. But say, uh, if there is a class in which a teacher teaches the course and then has an exam. And in that exam, the teacher gives all the students different question papers. 
Some students get easy paper, some students get difficult paper. The question would be not why there is an exam, the question is why there are different testings, why there are different question papers. So the, if there is a principle of testing, the testing should be uniform. If there are different tests for different people, that again raises the question, why does this happen? And again we are, <coughs> we are reduced to the idea that, that there is a supreme who by arbitrary fiat <coughs> decides that some people will get a tough test, some people will get an easy test. And you know, for in many, in especially uh, for thoughtful people, you know, often atheism can seem a more preferable option to instead of worshipping a god who discriminates like this. However, there is a third possibility. See, we have come, going back to the cricket match, or the, we have come not at the start of the match, we have come at the middle of the match. And there's already been an innings which has got over. So in the previous innings, you can go to the next slide. In the previous innings, as I said over here, that the a particular team has got a lead, another team has got a lag, accordingly. So we all are not just, our existence doesn't begin at birth. Birth is just one innings in our existence which goes over multiple lifetimes. And the starting point in this existence is determined by what we have done in our past. So based on the kind of score we have accumulated in our past, we get a starting point. So this understanding of a multi-life progression, it is the most reasonable way to reconcile the principle of cause and effect with the principle of justice. The we, we assume, we function, we have both these intuitions within us. Now we, we presume that, okay, if things are happening, there's a cause. Now why is this happening? If something has happened, as I said, give earlier example, that we function based on a cause-effect correlation. And we also intuitively feel that things should be just. Now injustice riles us so much because we feel it is wrong. Because we feel that is not the way things should be. So we have this intuitive sense of cause-effect correlation and justice. And both these can be reconciled through the understanding of life as a, of our existence as a multi-life progression. This would mean that what we call as destiny. Now with destiny I am talking about at birth. All of us get different starting points. This destiny is also a result of our past actions. And our past actions have determined our starting point. And similarly, some events that happen in our life, they are also determined by our past actions. Now let's look at actions a little bit more. So, there is an incident in the Mahabharat. There is an incident uh, where there is a discussion between Vidura, who is a wise minister, and Dhritarashtra, who is the attached king. And Dhritarashtra's son, uh, Duryodhana, is vicious. And Duryodhana, Duryodhana is the active villain and Dhritarashtra is the passive villain, the consenting villain. So now at one particular point Vidura tells Dhritarashtra that stop your son from his obstinacy, from his nefarious activities, from his antagonism towards their cousins the Pandavas. Otherwise your whole dynasty will be destroyed. At that time, Dhritarashtra tries to resort to dest destiny and he says, you know, if, if our dynasty is destined to be destroyed, then who am I, a tiny mortal, to stop the working of mighty destiny? <coughs> and Vidura responds that, O oh king, it is the consequences of our actions that are determined by destiny not our actions themselves. We may, we may study for an exam, diligently, and sometimes you know, maybe the competition is too stiff in that particular year, at that particular time, or maybe just before the exam we fall sick, or maybe if there is a human examiner, the examiner had a, has had a quarrel with their spouse the day before they came for the <laughs> assessment. So, 
things beyond our control that is where destiny plays a role if if a student doesn't study for the exam and the parents ask why are you not studying oh you know it's my destiny to fail that's not your destiny that's your irresponsibility <laughs> so we have our responsibility and destiny actually talks about the acknowledging the things that are beyond our control so in every situation in life there are some things which are in our control and some things which are not in our control so destiny determines the consequences of our actions not our actions themselves and all of us in our day to day life we know that there are factors beyond our control which shape the results now few fields of human activity are as performance driven as sports and yet sports sports player also have their own quirky superstitions <coughs> australia in, in cricket australia is <coughs> infamous as a team for sledging yeah, when i was in australia last year they said australians are very laid back people in everything except cricket <laughs> so just india just recently in india australia cricket series got over and it was a very spread with a lot of acrimony so the australians that their their whole motto is like in it to win at all costs and he one of australia many of these australian players they had their own superstitions there was an australian batsman mark taylor whenever he would go out to bat he would first go to the restroom and put down the lids of all the commodes <laughs> and then he would go out in bat and if he got out early he wouldn't go back to the pavilion he would first go to the restroom if any of the commode lids were open he would go and blast his teammates why did you keep this open because of that i got out <laughs> now there is no logical correlation between the player's bat performance in the field batting and the status of the commode lids <laughs> but the point is that actually sports players know that there is something beyond their own performance that determines the results and through their own quirky superstitions some sports players put a red handkerchief in their pocket there is a tennis player who would wear a earring only in one year <laughs> they all have their own quirky ways in which they try to appease that unknown that destiny <laughs> and they hope that that's how the results will come out for them so in the routine course of human affairs performance matters but performance is not all that matters so the uh, so one school of thought is where we think my performance alone is going to determine the result the other school of thought is that my performance doesn't matter everything is destined so here the dhritarashtra is trying to argue that oh everything is destined what can i do so arjun uh, so vidura is saying no you have your role to play please go so now when we talk about destiny these are little the sanskrit terms but the concept underlying them is quite simple so when we talk about destiny we can envision a water tank this water tank is like we could say it's like our karma tank whatever actions we have done in the past they have all accumulated together and then the water is going to flow out so in this water tank there is a inlet from which water is going in and there's a outlet from which water is coming out so the inlet the water is going that is going in that is the actions we are doing right now the actions we are doing right now they are also a part of the cycle of karma so if you're doing good actions they are going in into the karma tank and they will come out as good reactions at the same time there are certain actions which are coming certain certain water is flowing out of the tank the water that is flowing out of the tank is like what is happening to us so the, we, when we talk about destiny essence destiny essentially is the accumulation of all the karma that we have so that is called as sanchit karma the accumulated karma now within the accumulated karma there is kriyaman karma kriyaman is the ongoing karma what is the water going inside and there is prarabdha karma that is the water that has come out so for example as i said all of us have a starting point all of us have a body which has a particular kind of looks a born in a particular kind of family particular level of health particular level of memory we have certain set of uh, attributes 
that are going to be there with us in our life. We can change them a little bit here and there. But the basic model that is there, the basic uh, prototype that is there, that is what we have. And aprarabdha karma is the karma that we are going to get during our life, is the, what is going to happen to us. So when we talk about destiny, we could, in this life, the destiny happens in two ways. One is the starting point that we get, that is determined by our destiny. And so, uh, second is the major events that happen in our life. To give a travel metaphor, say all of us, we, when we talk about multi-life progression, implicit over there is that there is something which goes over multiple lives. That is our spiritual core, that is called as the Atman. And for the, at, for the spiritual core, the soul, the body is like a vehicle. So say if we have a vehicle, all of us have got different vehicles for our journey. So the body is like a vehicle that we have and we all have different vehicles. We are, we, for this lifetime, we have to use the vehicle we have. And along with that, when we are going on the road, we may, fa we may have to go through a hilly road. We may have some inclement weather. I talked about it right at the start, rain or storm or whatever. So uh, the... When we talk about destiny as events that happen to us, that is similar to a weather forecast. The weather forecast determines what conditions we are going to meet when we travel. They don't control how we travel. So in that sense, there is control externally, but at the same time there is freedom also internally. Please go ahead. So now, <coughs> For understanding how destiny and karma will play out, the unraveling the karma conundrum, no, the intelligence is important. By intelligence, we understand what is changeable and what is unchangeable. As if there are these two schools of thought in Sanskrit, they are called as karmavad and daivavad. Karmavad is the idea that everything is in my hands. Whatever I want to achieve, I will achieve. Whatever I set my mind, I'll get that. Now, in in terms of uh, empowerment, this sounds very empowering. You know, whatever you whatever you want, you can achieve. But actually, it has a flip side. When we decide I can achieve whatever I want, and then if I'm not able to achieve it, then that leads to depression. So instead of seeing failure as an event, we end up seeing failure as a person. All of us, may go through by our destiny certain bad patches in our life. You know, whatever we do, there are times when we are going through a good patch in our life and whatever we touch, it turns into gold. We touch stone, it turns into gold. And there are other times when whatever we touch, it turns into stone. <laughs> we touch gold, it turns into stone. Whatever we get into, it starts going wrong. And we may start thinking, oh, you know, my destiny is rotten. I am good for nothing. No, the traditional cultures, many of them had an implicit understanding that there is much that is beyond human control. Now, some of them went to the extreme of fatalism where they assumed that nothing was in our control. Our modern and postmodern culture goes to the other extreme of assuming that everything is in our control. And this assumption is actually a primary cause of mental health problems such as depression, mm, inferiority complex and overall negativity because when I think that everything is in my control and then I find that things are actually not in my control then I start thinking something must be wrong with me <coughs> but it's not, ne not necessarily yes if something is wrong with us we can improve it but sometimes despite our best efforts certain results may not come out and at that time we need to just understand okay this time some destiny is unfavorable so results are not coming but if I keep persevering, the results will eventually come. So intelligence means to know what is changeable and know what is unchangeable. And when we recognize this point, that there is something which is unchangeable, then we don't agonize over things beyond our control. At the same time, we also understand that there is something which I can change. There is something which is always in our control, even if it is small. At the very least, 
If nothing else is in our control, our attitude is in our control. Our consciousness is in our control. And some of us, we may respond to the same situation with an extremely pessimistic, negative attitude. Some of us may respond with a positive attitude. The positive attitude and negative attitude are not going to change the reality. The reality is what is it? If it's a stormy day, it's a stormy day. If it's a rainy day, it's a rainy day. But based on our actions, we can either magnify the problem or we can minimize the problem. So sometimes we may happen that, you know, as, as I said, sometimes we may just start doing one thing and the one person does something wrong, another person does something wrong, a third person does something wrong, and when the fourth person does something wrong, we just blow up. All the cumulative irritation that was there with the three persons, because of the actions of the first three persons, all that comes out on the fourth person. And then, there was a problem, but often, our reaction to a problem makes the problem worse. But if you understand, yes, some days are just bad days. Just like sometimes, the weather is good, sometimes the weather is bad. Now when the weather is bad, you know, oh, we, we may feel irritated. But we understand that our ir irritation doesn't really affect the weather gods. <laughs> so, <laughs> over a period of time, we just bury our irritation and move on with life. We adapt and move on. So destiny also, now, uh, also has this role. When we acknowledge the role of destiny in our life, that doesn't mean we become powerless, but we recognize where to focus our power. So, say, by destiny, there's going to be a stormy weather, rainy weather. Now, if at that time, I'm if somebody's driving a car, and if they have drunk too much, <laughs> and they're in a foul mood, and drive carelessly, then they may kill themselves, they may kill someone else. On the other hand, if, you know, because it's rainy weather, I have to be very careful now. They drive cautiously. So that inclement weather came by destiny. But how they acted within them, that was their choice. So by recognizing that there is something unchangeable, actually we can shift our focus to that which is changeable. And when we focus on what can be changed, what can't be changed, won't be that consequential. Yeah. So to put it succinctly, the free will interaction with destiny is that what happens to us is destiny, how we respond to it is free will. And in that sense, we always have the capacity to change our destiny. Here I'm using the word destiny in the second sense, what we achieve in our life. The events that happen to us, they may be fixed, but our response is not fixed. And therefore, the way things unfold in our life, that's also not fixed. That is up to us. Please go ahead. Yeah. Now spirituality, helps us to change our destiny. And how is that? It actually helps us to increase the distance between the event and the response. When we, the word spirituality is used in a very generic sense today. So whatever makes us feel good, you know, we see a mountain scenery, oh, it's so spiritual. Yes, it can be, but spiritual <laughs> is actually not just something that makes us feel good. Spiritual is also, it's not just a state of the mind, it is also a level of reality. Spiritual is not just a state of mind, it's also a level of reality. Our existence is two-dimensional, there's the material existence and there's the spiritual existence. We have a material side and we have a spiritual side. Like earlier I said, we are, there's a vehicle and there's a driver. So, when we understand spiritual knowledge, as is given in yoga texts like Bhagavad Gita, and when we practice some process of meditation, like, yo like yoga, bhakti yoga, various yogas, then by this, our consciousness rises from the material level to the spiritual level. So we could, our existence is two-dimensional, so material and spiritual. Now we could envision this as a, two st as a building with two levels. Say at the ground level, <coughs> there is no heating. So it's cold weather outside and all the cold which makes us tremble. But if you just go to the first floor, there is ample heating over there. It's cozy. So on the ground floor, we will be subjected to all the heat that is there, all the cold that is there. On the first floor, we'll experience relief. Similarly, 
Now, whatever happens by destiny, the inclement weather, the hostile people, all that happens, all that affects the ground floor of reality. Whatever negativity might come because of our destiny, that is going to affect us at the material level. But if we are spiritually aware, if we are spiritually knowledgeable, if we become spiritually aware, then we rise to the higher level of reality. When we become spiritually conscious, then we understand that, okay, these things are going wrong. We can respond to them. Spirituality enables us to be concerned, but not disturbed. We are concerned, because whatever happens at the material level <coughs> matters to us. At the same time, we are not disturbed, because we know this doesn't threaten me personally. I myself, at my core, am indestructible. Things may go wrong, but I, at my core, am indestructible. And with this understanding, we can have an inner sense of security. And with that sense of security, <coughs> with that sense of uh, uh, calmness within us, we can more maturely, more intelligently respond to whatever is happening at the material level of reality. So the when we feel threatened, when things are going wrong and we start feeling threatened, then often our reaction is a knee-jerk reaction. Don't think. And then that often worsens the situation. But when we, are, we feel secure internally because of our spiritual awareness, then we can respond more maturely. And even when bad things happen, we can cope with them. We can deal with them. And this is where, now all the processes of yoga, they can help, there are various yoga, there is Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, there is Dhyan Yoga, there is Bhakti Yoga. And, and there are processes for spiritual awakening in other religions of the world also. We are talking from the Vedic text perspective here, focus. But these principles are in many ways universal. The point is to raise our awareness from the material level to the spiritual level. To the extent we do that, to that extent, we uh, can experience relief from whatever adverse destiny is coming in our life and we can respond to it more maturely. And Bhakti Yoga has a special power in this, in that in Bhakti Yoga, we don't just depend on our endeavor to raise our consciousness from the material level to the spiritual level. Actually, we seek the grace of the Supreme Consciousness is known as God, is known as, in the Bhagavad Gita, is known by the name Krishna. So when we seek the <coughs> grace of the Almighty, that helps us to raise our consciousness upwards faster. And thus, we can actually weather the storms of life with much more ease. The storms will be there and they will be difficult. But the Bhagavad Gita says, Mat chittaha sarva durgani mat prasada tarishasi. In 18.58, in the Bhagavad Gita, it is said that, If you become conscious of me, you will pass over all obstacles by my grace. So, I will conclude with one last example of how things work. With respect to, now I talk about destiny and I will talk about, now about the absolute truth, God, who is like the Lord of destiny. To say there is a child. Mm, who has not done the homework and now uh, the mother knows the child has not done the homework and the mother also knows that the teacher is strict the teacher is going to punish the child so <coughs> the teacher has one way of punishing is that oh, you're not done your homework show your hand the stick one two three mm. <coughs> so when the teacher is going to do that the mother doesn't want the child to be beaten. At the same time, the mother also doesn't want the child to be undisciplined. So when that day, when the child is going to school, the mother puts on a nice thick glow on the child's head. <laughs> <laughs> and when the child goes to school, the teacher asks, have you done your homework? No. Come here. Stretch out your hand. Stretch out. The child stretches out the hand. The teacher, from the perspective of the observers, big noise comes, tack, tack, tack. But from the child's perspective, actually the glow is cushioning the glow. <laughs> the child doesn't feel any pain. So this metaphor, actually God is like the mother, Krishna is like the mother. We are like the child, the errant child who has not done the homework. The teacher 
is material nature. Material nature has its own laws. Now destiny is a part of the system of material administration. So we have certain reactions which are going to come to us. But the glow is spiritual consciousness, as or the devotional Krishna consciousness or God consciousness in general. So when we become, when our consciousness becomes absorbed in God, in higher spiritual reality, then that shelters us. How does that shelter us? Even in our day-to-day -day experience, we'll see that if we are absorbed in something, then we don't feel the inconvenience as much. Say, if we are going in a crowded train in India, just India locals are super crowded. So, you go in a crowded local, we may feel irritated. But same Indians, if they are watching a cricket match, thousands may crush, be crushed together in a, in, a, in a sports ground. They'll be enjoying it. Because their consciousness is not just simply caught in, okay, how much, uh, how uncomfortable this is. Their consciousness is in the cricket match. So, if our consciousness has a constructive object to be absorbed in, then whatever circumstantial problems we have, we don't feel them too much. And God is a supremely satisfying object for absorbing our consciousness. And when our consciousness becomes absorbed in him, whatever problems we face, externally the problems will come. But we won't suffer that much. They will be there, but we will weather them with grace, with dignity, and we'll grow through them. So whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. Whatever karma may get us to, we all have done certain, certain karma, we will all face different difficulties at different situations in our life. But if we have that glow of spiritual consciousness, then it will enable us to weather whatever storms <coughs> come in our life. But unfortunately, the child starts thinking, why do I need this glow? Child takes the glow away and throws it away. <laughs> <laughs> and then the teacher sticks coming in. So uh, for many of us, we don't feel the need for God, we don't feel the need for spiritual consciousness, and life seems to be going on fine. But then, if you don't, we are not sheltering us in the spiritual consciousness, then when life starts giving its blows, <coughs> we'll find it difficult to deal with. At the same time, <coughs> the glow is always available for us. And that's why when we face problems, uh, our attitude often is, uh, even if we sometimes mm, pray, meditate, seek some higher intervention, we are focused more on the problem. And we see God's grace, God's love, in terms of whether this problem is solved or not. If this problem is solved, then God loves me. If this problem is not solved, God doesn't love me. Maybe God doesn't even exist. <laughs> that is something like a child, sometimes children get captivated a particular toy. And the parents, child, I want this toy. Parents say, no, not now. Oh, you don't love me only. <laughs> the parents may have done so much for the child but the child reduces the love of the parents to that one gift providing of the toy and if that doesn't come the child will the parents don't love me if we look at our life if we if we are honest with ourselves you know, we will see many things that have gone wrong in our life but there are many things that have gone right in our life also whenever we have been successful no, we did do well. We did perform, we did study, we did achieve. But there were many other things which also fell, went right at that time. So, in that sense, it is not that God is unfair or God doesn't care for us. Now, if we are too focused at the material level of reality, we won't be able to perceive God's grace. We will not be able to shelter ourselves from those blows. So, when we approach, when we understand this whole principle of destiny, understand that sometimes we will go through a bad patch in our life. At that time, if we focus on raising our consciousness upwards, not so much on just solving that problem. That if we don't, it is a don't tell God how big your problems are. <laughs> tell your problems how big God is. But God is much bigger <laughs> and by His grace the problems can be solved. So destiny at one level is simply a material system of cause and effect. But beyond that, there is God, Krishna who is supervising it. And then, whatever happens to us, it's not that everything that happens is good. Bad things do happen. But everything that happens can be for good. Good can emerge from the bad also. 
and that will happen if we choose wisely if we choose wisely so many times when we seek some higher intervention through prayer we expect this is my problem and this should be the solution to the problem so we are at such situations half trusting god i have half trusting what do you mean we believe that god has the power to solve the problem he is omnipotent but he doesn't have the intelligence to solve the problem so i have to give him the intelligence <laughs> so often when we pray to god we want to form a partnership god your power my intelligence <laughs> and so this is the problem this is the solution i can't do it you do it for me <laughs> but the fully trusting god means that not only is god's power greater than ours his intelligence is also greater than ours and if we trust god and if we have if we put that faith and instead of focusing on the solution to the problem we focus on absorbing ourselves in in god in devotional meditation on him then we will find that he will bring good out of the bad also whatever bad is happening god is not just omnipotent he is also omniscient he is not as omniscient he is also omni benevolent ultimately he wants the good of everyone and if we just persevere if we persevere you know our struggles won't last forever but we will the struggles won't last forever but we will summarize i spoke and then we can have questions i started by so the last point i'll come to that and so i <coughs> started by talking about how in the tsunami we destroyed people on the coast people who were in the ocean lived so uh, our life is often shaped by forces that are beyond our control and different traditions call this by kismat destiny fate daiva so what exactly is this So I talked about <coughs> destiny as the word has two meanings. One is what happens to us, and second is what we achieve. So what happens to us in that term, destiny is unchangeable. But what we achieve, that is changeable. And in that, so, so what is destiny? It is simply the karmic accumulation of whatever we have done in the past. Somebody may say, "I don't believe in this." Okay. This belief is also a form of belief. So by living, we have to choose that. that thought system which is the most empowering for us and broadly when we see the the act of destiny that starts our life itself so we are some are born wealthy some are born poor that itself seems discriminate and we can have three explanations for this like a like a cricket or a baseball match where the starting score seems to is different for two teams so it could be that the scorekeeper the scoreboard is conked off or the scorekeeper is biased like that the world operates by chance or the uh, god is biased chance is a very disempowering idea and the idea that god operates by arbitrary caprice that is also very disheartening so and it's counterintuitive it's counter intuitive to our innate sense of justice and cause effect correlation so multi life progression the idea that we have come in the middle of the match not at the start of the match and the team's different scores is based on what they have scored in the previous innings that reconciles both the cause effect correlation based on which we function and the sense of justice which we aspire for so our starting points in life are determined by what we have done in the past and um, although our starting points are different based on our particular situations but we do have choice right now our free will is always there so destiny determines the consequences of our actions not our actions themselves and that means during the journey of our life sometimes we may meet difficulties but that's like say our destiny is determined the vehicle which we have in a journey and the weather that we are going to get but how we drive that is entirely up to us and by driving carefully we can avoid dangers we can reach our destination safely like that by choosing wisely we can progress and achieve constructive things in our life so what happens to us is destiny how we respond to it is free will to think that everything is in our hands is to put a burden of too much on our own heads and when we are not able to achieve what we want to achieve we feel disheartened we become depressed 
if a modern modern post modern ideology goes towards placing too much initiative in human hands some traditional ideologies focus too much on fatalism putting too much in the hands of destiny but both work in coordination and intelligence means to know what is unchangeable to accept it to know what is changeable and focus on it and <clears throat> the response which we have to situations that if we are if we are at a materialistic level of consciousness then we feel threatened and we often make a react in a way that worsens the problem but if we understand that reality is too tired that actually there is my existence is at its core spiritual and we seek spiritual shelter then what happens the material level doesn't threaten us so much and then we can be concerned but not disturbed we can respond naturally and various processes for spiritual consciousness can raise our consciousness to the spiritual level bhakti yoga not only gives us the channel for raising our consciousness but attracts divine grace for sheltering our consciousness in spiritual reality so just like a mother who gives a glow to shield the child from the teacher's stick like that bhakti yoga offers us mother is like god krishna and he offers us the glow of god consciousness by which the life's problems won't trouble us so much they'll be there but we won't be so troubled by them and in order to bear the glow of Krish of god consciousness we need to uh, uh, change the basis of our relationship with god instead of expecting god to solve our problems on our terms and uh, that like a child asking for this toy and reducing the mother's parents love to that toy we recognize that god is not only more powerful than us but also more intelligent than us and he will get not only <laughs> bad things can happen but he will bring good out of it and whatever karma may get us to krishna will get us through so just as the the scuba divers they went deep within and that's why what happened at the surface the tsunami did not affect them so like that if we go deep within ourselves to our spiritual core then what happens at the surface of our life it won't trouble us so much rather we will be able to respond to it maturely and whatever happens in life we will be able to grow through it so our spirituality changes our destiny because it helps us to choose the best response to whatever destiny brings in our life and by those best responses we create a bright future for ourselves thank you very much ചേതനാചരൺ Sure. Sure. I have a burning question, very much like the pragmatic portion of it, you know. Yes. How to incorporate this in our daily lives, you know, through practice. I guess for me, I'm thinking of, and when you talk about just bringing our consciousness to that deeper level, for me, it's like just centering myself, grounding practices, uh, you know, just connecting myself to the earth, and just connecting myself to the breath. I guess that's the only thing I can think of. But you know, as a human being, I lose that, like all of, you know, yeah. on an everyday basis. So any just that's practical true. solutions for everyday people who are not wearing the beautiful orange robe and <laughs> struggling with colorful <laughs> life. <laughs> okay. So how can we practically stay spiritually grounded? Actually, orange robes are no guarantee of spiritual consciousness. <laughs> 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 So spirituality ultimately is about the color of our consciousness not the color of our dress. Uh now there are three levels when we talk about raising our consciousness in the in the yoga tradition the three modes of material nature this tamoguna rajoguna sattvaguna mode of ignorance mode of passion mode of goodness these are basically modes of function in the mode of ignorance people are very lethargic apathetic uh, and in mode of passion hyperactive 
and they start one thing and then this reacts, this goes wrong, this goes wrong, this. what is happening? And in mode of goodness, people are thoughtfully active. So one way of putting this is, some of describing these three modes, goodness, passion and ignorance is, some people make things happen, some people watch things happen, some people wonder what happened. <laughs> <laughs> So, to the extent we can do, situate ourselves in nature's mode of goodness, then that helps us to not be reactionary, not to have knee-jerk reactions. So as you said, being close to nature, regulating our breath, that all brings us to the mode of goodness. So, Sattvat Sanjayate Gyanam Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that when we are in the mode of goodness, knowledge emerges from that. Clear understanding comes and we can make wise choices. So just uh, finding out what are the activities within us, for us, that just calm us down. Mm -hmm. For some of us it may be regulating our breath, some of us it may be going for a walk, some of us it may be just going close to nature, for some of us it may be journaling. We all can find out which activities calm us down. That is, one level mm -hmm. we come to the mode of goodness. Beyond that, there is the spiritual level of consciousness, where there are specific spiritual practices. So as I said, yoga, meditation, these are all various levels of pra various practices which raise our consciousness to the spiritual level. And regularly engaging in these practices helps us to make spiritual consciousness a regular experience. So if we daily have some time for meditation, then <clears throat> that enables us, uh, that makes spiritual consciousness a familiar consciousness for us. Something which we do regularly, then when there is a crisis in our life, and there's something that's troubling us too much, we can take shelter of the spiritual at that time. If we don't have that habit, then the consciousness stays, stays so caught in the material things that we can't draw it out and focus on the spiritual. But a regular practice, helps us to focus the consciousness on the spiritual. And as I said, there are different forms of meditation. So now there is spiritual consciousness and there is also devotional consciousness. In spiritual, we focus primarily on the imperishable eternality that pervades, the that underlies material existence. Beyond the body, there is a spiritual core. Beyond the changing material world, there is a spiritual reality. Now devotional means that we go beyond generic spiritual reality to specifically the topmost spiritual reality, that is God, the absolute truth. So now, uh, now there are specific mantras that we can chant. So mantra meditation is one form of meditation and that helps us to raise our consciousness rapidly upwards. So I'm giving that example of say the two story building. The material level is the lower story, the spiritual level is the higher story, higher level. So various forms of meditation and yoga they are like climbing up the stairs. But mantra meditation, specifically mantras which are centered on the names of God, they are like an elevator. Because <laughs> when that, that, it's like the elevator comes down, you just step in and the elevator lifts us up. So like that, when we chant the mantras and we enter into the mantra, our consciousness goes deep into the mantra, then just by that act, our consciousness will rise upwards. And by the repeated utterance of spiritual sound vibrations, we find our consciousness moving upwards. So we have to create a regular regimen of spiritual practices. And those will shelter us when we face difficulties in our life. And as such, uh, for all of us, uh, life, or our choices in life, they will never progress along a straight line. It is more of disorientation <coughs> and reorientation. Say when a plane flies from one place to another. Just yesterday I came from Seattle to Boston. So when I <clears throat> so when we fly from one place to another, the plane more than ninety percent of the time it is off course because of the wind pressure, because of the atmospheric conditions, because of the cloud uh, cloud clustering. Now it is because the cloud get, it gets reoriented. The pilot, the autopilot system, whatever, it keeps reorienting. So like that. The very nature of life is that we'll get disoriented. Mm -hmm. So we need reorientation. 
and the best way to do this reorientation is through spiritual association so there are individual practices i talked about what earlier but the reorientation happens much more powerfully when we have some spiritual association so programs like this uh, if there are spiritual programs like this which you participate in on a regular basis then they remind us oh yeah there is a spiritual side to my life also which is important and that so we will go off track but we reorient ourselves we go off track we reorient ourselves if we keep reorienting ourselves then overall we progress towards the spiritual destination answer your question yeah, thank, thank you thank you our past life karma hmm. is our destiny for future life we are okay. all born based on how what were our quality of karma we had in the past life yeah and we are born possibly in a bad family poor family or bad habit your parents you know, like mm. that now that child is born based on his past life karma and at birth everybody is shudra you are shudra i am shudra everybody is shudra and by our karma we elevate ourselves to vaishya kshatriya or brahman so now if a child is born mute you know, totally brain dead you know he cannot do any purusha you know from mm. and cannot elevate himself so how do you explain the situation of the child who is not capable to do anything for himself no prarab i mean no purusha okay. so if a child is born very very vegetative vegetative in a vegetative state when the child cannot do anything in this life so, so what is purusha so he cannot pursue any goals of life any purushartha so what is the how do you explain such a situation okay. See, god has yeah. given him any opportunity not in, i'll come to this point so let me there are two different things over here one is that if we see the principle of karma from a material perspective the principle of karma we need to see it from a spiritual perspective if we see it if we incorporate <coughs> this principle of karma into a materialistic world view it can seem very harsh you no know, a baby a child is innocent now why is the child suffering like this how can god be so cruel so actually in a in a sense you know to say that things happen by chance or even things ha- things happen by chance can seem uh, more more fair than to say that a small child has done some bad karma because of his act no it can so we have to understand that actually if we bring the principle of karma into a materialistic world view we can come off as very insensitive if we don't understand it properly so when we have a spiritual world view that means we understand that this life is only one innings it's only one innings and sometimes even in this uh, this life may have, some person may have some child may have a lot of difficulties but from the perspective of eternity that is not a very big phase so sometimes we all may get certain karmas we all may go through some karmas by which we are put in a very constricted state and when that constricted state comes we have to know that this is a phase in the world is a station it is not a destination so even for a baby this this is a passing phase if i have a materialistic world view then this life of 60 70 80 years whatever we feel so big from the perspective of spirituality from the perspective of eternity this life is not very big so we all will go through different phases in our life when the child is completely powerless to do anything but sometimes we may also experience that we are put in circumstances we just can't do anything sometimes we may fall very sick sometimes you know everybody not only misunderstands us everybody actually just doesn't allow us to clarify also just judges us and blames us and victimizes us but so so for us that may be for 6 months 1 year we may be sick and we may misunderstood for some patch of life patch of some period for that particular child it may be for one lifetime but we see from the perspective of eternity so in some situations you know we 
uh, we just have to weather the karma we can't do much further so to give a tennis metaphor now in a, in a tennis match sometimes a player is serving and sometimes a player is receiving so now the player who is serving has much more freedom now where to hit the ball the player who is receiving is very restricted the options the ball is going to come here the player has to stretch there and hit from there itself so now in our life based on our situation sometimes we are serving sometimes we are receiving the problem comes when we are receiving and we expect to have the freedom of serving <laughs> we move our hand and the ball just whizzes by what happened <laughs> <laughs> so we have to recognize that some phases in our life you know, our freedom will be very restricted we just have to do the best that we can with whatever life sends our way there are other times when we can take initiative we can make plans we can actualize things so sometimes the serving sometimes in the tennis there are some players are such good servers that when the player can just watch all four aces go off he can just can't do anything so like that sometimes life may just send the you know, aces our way just can't do anything so we all go through phases like that but when we understand it is only a phase it is a phase and in that phase basically what is required is just tolerate the karma and then eventually that phase will end whether in this life or in a future life and then the person gets a portion to serve and that time the person can do a positive karma and move forward towards the uh, towards fulfilling their spiritual destiny in this life that child is nishkarma totally yeah that child will not do this any further karma so that you beginning and end is same so in the next life what is going to happen the child is not washed this karma or not added anything to it this yeah. water tank has not no intake no output so he is born again as the okay. dead uh, it's vegetable child so now okay so if a child is uh, doesn't do any karma in this life then what happens to the child in the future life mm. so whatever karma caused that child to be born like that that karma is exhausted now so the child has incurred the karma so in a karmic the karma tank the negative karma which caused that particular thing to happen that's over now we move forward to a future life where the other karma that is there now a lot of positive negative karma has gone whatever remaining karma is there positive and some negative that will determine the starting point of that child mm -hmm. now one important thing over here is that even such a situation the child may not be able to consciously do anything but the parents can provide spiritual growth for the child the parents can give devotional stimuli and those devotional stimuli can spiritualize the consciousness of the child see basically uh, instead of just seeing the child as being born in a vegetative state we can see it in terms of free will uh, we all based on our past karma get different scopes for our free will some people may be born uh, with great speaking ability with great charisma and they can influence hundreds of thousands of people some people they can influence just a few people so the, the scope of the free will how much we can use our free will how much we can influence our own future others future that is determined by our karma to some extent now while our actions in this life are shaped by our karma they are also what happens to us also shaped by our circumstances the child cannot do any karma but the parents have a special opportunity over there to actually choose to choose to give the child spiritual stimuli so as was mentioned in the introduction uh i i derive a lot of inspiration from his own radhanath swami who is my spiritual master so he faced a similar situation one of his disciples was himself a doctor they had a child who was uh, who was born severe neurologically damaged and the doctor said that she will not be able to live for long and for the time she was living also she was in great pain so this doctor he came to meet <coughs> meet his spiritual master he said um, so he told him um, that you have two choices either you can accept that life happen everything happens by chance and you just were unlucky 
or there is a plan over here. We accept there is a plan, but I'm not able to figure out what is the plan. Said so that. So Radhanath Maharaj told him that actually you should see this, this child, as having come in your life to give you an opportunity to learn selfless love. Mm -hmm. When a parent loves a child, that, that parental love itself is quite selfless. But still there is the expectation, my child will grow up, my child will go famous, and my child will spread my fame. But this child will never do that for you. And at the same time, if you care for her, you should see that it is by God's arrangement this child has come in your life. And every single thing that you do for this child, God is accepting that service through this child. And, and they had this consciousness. It just completely changed their perspective of looking at things. And then she had an elder sister. She saw that whenever this little girl, this baby, she would always be crying, but if she would hear birds chirping, she would calm down. So her elder sister went to a nearby garden and she would hear the birds chirping. She had to imitate their sounds. Just to come and do the sounds for her sister. And just by doing that, practicing daily, daily, you know, she became a beautiful singer. <laughs> and now she sings uh, very wonderful kirtans, and she's one of very well-known kirtan singers. Mm -hmm. And they further noticed that, they further thought that this child, you know, many other <coughs> saintly people would come and pray for that child. The child would be completely surrounded by spiritual sound. And <clears throat> As I said, that the spiritual vibration, if that the child has very limited consciousness to choose anything, if the child is provided spiritual vibrations, then the whole consciousness can get spiritualized. Because the child doesn't have free will to choose what to be conscious of. If spirituality is provided, the child will be spiritually conscious. And then what to speak of um, uh, any future life, the child becomes completely spiritually conscious, then that child can get liberated. Child can direct, if the child, because of the filling of the consciousness of the child with spiritual vibration, spiritual orientation, the child can attain a spiritual destination. So sometimes bad things, some terrible things can happen in our life, but if we have spiritual consciousness, we can actually minimize the minimize the agony that comes because of that, and we can find the opportunity for that person's spiritual growth as well as our spiritual growth even in that adverse situation. Okay. Yes, please. Okay, we'll come. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit more about how uh, the connection of karma to future lives and future stations is mentioned? Okay. <coughs> what is the connection of karma to our future lives, future stations? So the body is like a vehicle. And now, if you are going, say if you are going on a cross country journey, and then you have a particular we have a particular vehicle for say twelve hours. After that, we have to change a vehicle. Now, when we change the vehicle, which vehicle will we take? That will depend on two things. One is our preference. Second is our budget. <laughs> so similarly, the body that we get in our next life. Is determined first by our preference, what our desires are, what our level of consciousness is, what is it that what we wish to do. Uh, or then secondly, it is based on our karmic budget. So the kind of karma we do in our life, that and the kind of desires that we cultivate, both of them determine our next body. And another example could be that the body is like a house for the soul. So the body is like a house, but it is like a rented house. We are tenants in this house. <laughs> we are not the owners. And people who are living in a rented house, one of their fondest aspirations is to have their own house. Because a rented house, we have to go any time out of it. Our own house, that's our own house, we can stay. So like that, we have, we as souls have been going through many lifetimes. And we have been on the journey of spiritual evolution. So every house that we get, it's a temporary house. But in this house, in the present house that we have, we can get a permanent house. If we, if as long as we love temp the temporary, we have to get a temporary instrument for pursuing that love. If we love worldly things, 
and we will get a material body to pursue our love for those worldly things. But if we learn to love the eternal, if we devote ourselves to God, then that devotion can transport us to the eternal realm. Now when we learn to love God more than we love the world, then God takes us out of this material world and takes us to the eternal abode where we get an eternal body, where we live eternally. So reincarnation is a process, you go one life, next life, next life, but reincarnation culminates in liberation, where you get out of the cycle. So in, in our present body, if we learn to love the eternal, if we learn to love God more than we love the world, then we get out of the cycle and attain eternal life. How do we balance the material and spiritual sides of our life? <coughs> if we, we do our meditation, but then afterwards we are pursuing our next job, next car, whatever. So the, basically, the two don't have to be contradictory. They can be complementary. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that in 6.16, Natya Ashnatastu Yogosti Na Chaikanta Manashnata Na Chati Swapna Shilasya Jagrata Neva Chaji. One who eats too much or eats too little. Such a person cannot be a yogi. One who sleeps too much or sleeps too little. Such a person cannot be a yogi. So what he means by that is that we have a material side. If we, the, so food, sleep, these are material needs. Now if we obsess over them, then they consume our consciousness. And then they distract us from spiritual world. But if we deprive ourselves of them, too much, then, then also we are craving for that. Oh, when will I get this? When will I get this? When will I get this? And then again we can't focus on the spiritual. So the idea is that money is the means for living. It is not the purpose of living. So we need material things in our life. And as long as we understand that they are tools for me for functioning in this world and for growing spiritually, then we can have them as complementary. So not too much, not too little. So when we are in a materialistic culture, we get consumed by the illusion that the more material things we have, the more happy we become. Right. In fact, nowadays, the whole idea is of mindless accumulation. Just get more, 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 more. And when we are consumed like that, then we can't be spiritual. But being material, but taking care of our material side means we see that we sh at one level in terms of our practical activities we separate. And okay, this is a time for my spiritual life. This is a time for my material life. But ultimately, we have to know that God is not just served through only our directly spiritual activities. We chant, we pray, we worship. But God is also present in the world. And the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, "Swa karmana tamabhyarcha siddham vindati manava." By your work, worship him. So, uh, some people translate this as work is worship. So, the Bhagavad Gita teaches work is worship. However, the Bhagavad Gita specific trans precise word is Swa Karmana Tamapyarcha. By your work, worship him. Now, if work itself were worship, then the donkey would be the greatest worshipper. <laughs> so, work can be made into worship. And it will be made into worship when there is God consciousness within us. So we need to spend some time to cultivate God consciousness. But afterwards, we don't have to see our work simply as material. You can see that also as spiritualizer. Now if we have a family, you know, the family, uh, the family members are also parts of God. We are in a relationship by the arrangement of God. And by serving them, by taking discharging our responsibilities in a mood of service to God, that activity can also be spiritualized. If we have a job, if we have a profession, you know, we all have been given certain talents, certain interests, and we can develop those talents in a mood of service, in a mood of contribution. That whatever God-given talents I have, 
I should do justice to them. I develop them by which I can make a contribution. Arjuna, the person to whom the Bhagavad Gita was spoken, he's a great devotee, but at the same time he's also a great archer. And how did he become a great archer? He practiced diligently. It is not that he thought that, oh, I'll just be spiritual, I'll not do my archer. He did his archer. So the point is that it's not that we have to give up the material life to become spiritual. The point is we do have to give up the illusion that material things will make us happy. So if we see material things as tools instead of ends, then the material and spiritual can be complementary rather than than competitive or contradictory. And for that we need philosophical understanding. If we regularly study wisdom texts like the Bhagavad Gita, come to spiritual programs, then we remember that spiritual and material, they are both complementary. You know, I, my ultimate purpose is spiritual. I do that directly through spiritual activities and I do it indirectly through spiritualizing my material activities. But if we don't have spiritual association, if we don't have spiritual reading, then the world is illusion that material things will make me happy. That will consume us and then we will not be able to balance the material and spiritual side. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you. Let me share. You are saying that Sattvika and Rajat Guna are both complementary to each other. Okay. That's what you mean? Are Sattvika and Rajaguna complementary? I would say not. Sattvika is not necessarily spiritual. Rajaguna is not necessarily material. Mm -hmm. That what makes something material or spiritual is ultimately our intention. So, if we have intention to exploit and enjoy, that is selfish and materialistic. Mm -hmm. If we have intention to serve and contribute, then that is spiritual. And sometimes, while doing actually in a more spiritual, we may use sattva guna and we may use raja guna also. So, then they become complementary. They, can, they both can be used for a spiritual purpose. Mm -hmm. okay. So, we are coming uh, a little bit towards the, towards the end of our time together. We're gonna make sure we're honoring everyone in our room. Um, a lot of people have other commitments and dinner plans and things like that. Maybe if there's one short-ish question, we can, we can have one more question. I know there's some hands up. Um, and, and for those of you who, unfortunately, we didn't get to your question, if you wouldn't mind hanging around, if you'd like to speak with Chaitanya Charan, um, you know, perhaps you can kind of connect with him one-on-one. -on -one. But if we can have, if someone is fairly certain their question is pretty small and <laughs> short. Um, so, any questions? I had a question that was, um, I think it's going to be required only a small answer. <laughs> okay. um, and that is, you've just spoken today about bhakti yoga. Does that mean that the only one that you believe in? Okay. Is bhakti yoga the only yoga you believe in or is that the only yoga that you practiced? No, the Bhagavad Gita is an inclusive book. It talks about all yogas. And it gives them their due place. And different people are at different levels in their spiritual growth. So, not everyone will be equally receptive to the same process. Now, Bhakti Yoga, because it invokes the power of God, it is especially expeditious. You know, we don't depend only on our power, our own intelligence for rising upwards. We can invoke a power greater than ours for rising upwards. And that's why it's expeditious. However, the various yogas are all valid processes for spiritual growth. And depending on a person's uh, spiritual evolution, at different times, they may be receptive for different processes for spiritual growth. So, we recommend Bhakti Yoga. That's not that we, the Bhagavad Gita itself. Sarva Dharman Paritya Maam Ekam Sharanam. Krishna uses various processes, but then he says, just forget everything else, just practice Bhakti. And the Bhagavad Gita is, cat a, is inclusive, at the same time it is also conclusive. It gives place for all different yogas, but it conclusively recommends Bhakti Yoga. So depending on a person's uh, level of spiritual elevation, they may choose different yogas for practicing. But if a person is capable, then Bhakti Yoga will be especially expeditious.